Well, if you've never read Pilgrim's Progress, then I would encourage you to read Pilgrim's Progress, for it is a classic, a classic book. I think we have it in our library here. If you have a Kindle, you can get it on Kindle for free, and it's available all over the place for pretty free, and it's for, for, for a very cheap price, and it's an excellent book to read. But let me just give you a quote from it, because Christian, the pilgrim in the story, he is in the middle of the valley of the shadow of death. And about the middle of the valley, the writer Bunyan says, I observed the mouth of hell. When Christian saw it, he wondered what he should do because of the flames and the smoke that poured from it. Not to mention the sparks and hideous noises. These things had no respect for Christian's sword. He was forced to put up his sword and turn to another weapon called all prayer. And if you turn with me into uh, the book of Ephesians and chapter 6 and verse 18. While you're finding it, let me read it because I don't want to read the whole verse. It just has here, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions. Reading Bunyan there, he says he was forced to put up his sword and to turn to another weapon called all prayer. The verse preceding the one I've just read from, verse 18 of Ephesians chapter 6, says... Take, uh, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Bunyan, he's forced to put up his sword and turn to another weapon called all prayer. And our verse here, verse 18. Pray in the Spirit, or and pray in the Spirit. Gives the idea, we've been looking at the Christian in their armour through these verses. And we've looked at different portions of armour, the helmet of salvation, not in the order now, but the helmet of salvation, the belt of truth, and we saw last week the offensive weapon, which is also used for defence, for parrying the blows, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And then we read in the NIV, and pray in the Spirit. And it gives the idea, as Bunyan does, that... Prayer is part of the armour. Part of the armour or another weapon. Full stop. So we put on the armour. Now we have the sword of the spirit. Now what we need is the weapon of prayer. So we turn for the weapon of prayer. But what I think Bunyan is saying is that there are times in the Christian life when the assault on the saint by the devil is so great, so strong, that all you can do is pray. It's a bit like the old westerns, surrounded by the Indians, and you call for the cavalry, and the cavalry come. All you can do is pray. Well, thank God that there is that type of urgent prayer in desperate situations. But I believe that the prayer that is spoken of in this verse, verse 18 of Ephesians chapter 6, is more than that. It's not just saying that you have all this armour and you have this sword, but as Bunyan says, there are times when, well, that won't do you any good and what you need then is another weapon, prayer. It's not just saying that. It's going beyond that. It's saying more than that. When we look at it literally in the Greek, not in the NIV, as we have in the Bibles in front of us here, but when we look at it literally in the Greek, this, I hope, will become clearer. Now you might say, aren't you nitpicking? Aren't you nitpicking going back to the Greek and all this? Are you, are you just trying to drag out your sermons in Ephesians? You're, you're going for some kind of record, are you? Is that what you're doing? Because we've been a long time in Ephesians. We've been a long time in his armour. What difference does it make looking at it literally? Get on with it, man. Let's move to another book. But I'm going to tell you that it, I believe it makes all the difference in the world. It takes it from being just urgent prayer 
in a desperate situation, which is a wonderful gift from God that we can do, it takes it from being that. It's more than that. Paul is not just saying that prayer is part of the armour or a weapon. It is so much more. Because you see, without prayer, you can be clothed in all the fancy armour in the world. You can have that armour, but without prayer, it will do you no good. It will do you no good. What I want to say this morning, and if you like, this can be a title, prayer makes the Christian a fearless soldier. Prayer makes the Christian a fearless soldier. So let's consider this literal translation first of all. That will set things down for us. The literal translation. Verse 18 in our NIV, if you have the NIV in front of you, says, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions. In other words, and links it with what's gone before. Therefore, prayer is part of the armour. That's what the NIV seems to be suggesting. But literally, the Holy Spirit isn't mentioned at this point. He's mentioned later. Literally, the Greek words say, let me go from verse 17. This is the NIV in verse 17. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now the literal for the next bit. Through... All prayer and petition. Through all prayer and petition. Through all, links it with verse 17, links it with the sword of the Spirit. In other words, use the sword with prayer. But prayer in these verses is not limited to just the sword. It's not limited to just that. He's not saying, you've got the sword, now you need to pray that it will be effective. He's saying more than that. Through all prayer. Go to the start of the passage. Verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. That introduces the whole section on the Christian in his armour or in her armour. It introduces that whole section of the Christian soldier. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. To be so. To be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, as we've seen, we need to be equipped for battle. So we need the armour. But above all, we need prayer. We need prayer. And I put it to you that that literally is what Paul is saying. He's saying to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. He is the armour. You need that. But you need prayer. You need prayer. So much more do you need prayer. Wearing the armour is not enough. Go back to our reading in Samuel. And verse 20. 1 Samuel 17 and verse 20. Israel is armed. Israel is armed. And what you find is that David comes along and midway through the the verse we read, he reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle positions, shouting the war cry. There's David. What does David do? He runs, doesn't he? He runs to see the men marching and he runs to listen to what they're doing. He runs to see them all lining up and the Philistines standing across against them as it were. But as he's running, as he's looking, if you were an observer there, your war correspondent, you'd say, it was a splendid sight seeing the mighty army of Israel striding forth, all arrayed in their armour with their weapons and so on. What a sight to see. What a sight to behold. They looked the part. But looking the part isn't enough, is it? Isn't enough. Look at verse 23. Goliath, the Philistine champion, comes from Gath. He steps out from his lines and shouts his usual defiance. David hears it, but then verse 24. When the Israelites saw the man, they all ran from him in great terror. 
They're armed. They're ready for battle. But here comes the enemy. And what do they do? Oh, they run back in fear. And it's not just a stumble. It's not just a momentary, momentary thing. Where Saul, the king, is able, or one of his commanders is able to say, Look, men, okay, he's one man and he's great, but we've got God on our side. We've stumbled, but let's not fall completely. It's not like that. It's not just a stumble. And they're going to come to their senses. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, we see... Once again, on hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. That's before David comes. And then in verse 14. Well, I've lost the verse, actually. Verse 24, sorry. No, I can't find it. Oh, blast. I've put the wrong one down here. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, there it is. Verse... Let me put these on. I was going to do it this morning, I was going to try with these this morning, but I haven't got quite used to the looking down here, looking up you. So let's try it, because I'm getting everything wrong here. For 40 days, the Philistine came forward every morning and evening and took his stand. So you see, this is the point I'm making. It's not a momentary thing. It's not one time and then they've got back together and they've rallied themselves. It's 40 days. This is a habit. A habit of fear. They're equipped for battle, but they're not, are they? They have the armour, but they're not really equipped. They lacked any real armour. They lacked the armour that would make them fearless. And what I want to say this morning is that, well, it was in our prayer as well, we look at the state of the church in the land today. Too many Christians are like the armies of Israel. Too many churches are like the armies of Israel. We sing our hymns. Maybe we sing them with great gusto. Maybe we sing them very well. We march onto the battlefield. But we have a sight of the enemy. And at the sight of the enemy, we're so often, Christians are so often routed. You see, many Christians know about the armour. They know about the Christian armour. Many churches... Well, they might say, or we might say, they appear to be almost perfect in doctrine, in their teaching. They're wonderful in their teaching. It's all accurate. You can check it all thoroughly with the Bible, and it's all so. They have an eagle eye, unlike me with these things. They have an eagle eye for error. They can spot it a mile off. They only have to talk to you. For a little while, and they can pick up one word in you that tells them, ah, heretic, heretic. They're the sort who would read the story of Gideon. You know Gideon and his fleece? Gideon, in wanting to come to a position of trust of the Lord, he asks the Lord. He says, if I lay this fleece before you, Will you moisturise it when all around is dry? Or on another occasion, will you make it dry and make all the ground moisturised? The Lord does just that, to strengthen Gideon's faith. But, ah, those who are perfect in their doctrine, who know all about the army, uh, the armour, they're the ones who say Gideon was, he was a wicked man, putting the Lord to the test. He was a failure. That's what Gideon was, a complete and utter failure. We wouldn't do such a thing. They conform to the Christianity of the Bible. They do. They conform to the Christianity of the Bible. They're in every way orthodox. In other words, they conform to the Christianity of the Bible. That's orthodoxy. Following the Bible closely. Orthodox. But it's a dead orthodoxy. It's dead. They are like the church at Ephesus. If you turn with me to Revelation chapter 2. The church at Ephesus. The Lord says to them in verse 2 of Revelation chapter 2. I know your deeds... 
your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men. You see, you're orthodox. That you have tested, there's your orthodoxy, those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and endured hardships for my name, and have not grown weary yet. I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. That was the church at Ephesus. They were orthodox, but it was a dead orthodoxy. They'd lost their first love, their first love for Christ. It had gone and in its place was all this dryness, all this coldness. And such a church or such a Christian, when they face a real assault from the devil, what often happens is pandemonium. Pandemonium. Look at churches. And you say, well yes, they've, they've got it spot on in terms of their teaching." But why is it you look at them and you see fractions, you see divisions? All this is evidence that they've been captured by the devil. They've been lured by him. You see churches that are like this and they often come across as very aloof, superior. What you meet with when you talk with them is is a kind of a facade. You can't really meet with the real person. There's this superior air and this facade about them. What's happened? The devil's come. And they've fallen into pride more often than not. They're paralysed. Just like David. In verse 39, David tries walking around with the armour, Saul's armour. He says, I cannot go in these. Because I'm not used to them. I'm not used to them. Like David. They have the armour. But they're not used to it. They're not used to it. Their greatest problem. I believe. And one of the great problems in the church today is not, indeed, is not this the greatest problem in the the church today? (coughs) Is the want, the need for personal or corporate prayer. In other words, Christian, do you pray? Are you a praying saint? If you're a Christian here this morning, Are you someone who sees the importance and the value of personal prayer? Do you have a personal prayer life? And then likewise for the church. Corporate. In other words, does the church come together as a body? This is just a question put out, not speaking of us specifically here this morning. But does the church, do the churches in our land today, do they value prayer? Do we value prayer as a church? Prayer is what is needed. You can have all the armour in the world. And it's good armour. We've seen, we've been through verse by verse and seen what this armour stands for. That it's really, it's centred on Christ. And that only in Christ do we stand. Christ is our armour. And each part represents some different aspect of what Christ has done for us. But without prayer, you may look smart in the mirror. Without prayer, it will be of no use to you. You see, prayer proves the armour. In verse 39, when David says, I cannot go in these because I'm not used to them. In the Hebrew, it's, I haven't proved them. I haven't tested them. They haven't been tried with me. I haven't proved them. Ah, but David, David will go, won't he? Though he won't go in Saul's army, in Saul's armor, David will go. He will go, and the Lord will be with him. And David comes against the Philistine in verse forty-five. We read, "You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord." the God of the armies of Israel whom you've defied David comes in the armour that he has proved and he has proved that armour through prayer and the armour that he comes in is the name of the Lord the name of the Lord is a strong tower the righteous run into it and they are safe 
David has proved his armour. And it's not so much that David has spent nights practising. You know, he takes his, uh, these five smooth stones and he has a sling. It's not so much that David spent the nights with the, the sheep while the sheep have been uh, just grazing or sleeping. He's been there practising with his stones and aiming at things. He may have done some of that. But his dependence, his assurity, his certainty that he will stand against the Philistine and triumph is not based on his own skill with a sling. You don't see David later on in his life known for his use of a sling. That's the weapon at hand now, but it doesn't matter. What matters is that his true weapon, his true power, is that the Lord God Almighty is on his side. And that he, and this is key, he knows it. So we say... If God be for us, who can be against us? We go, oh yes, amen. Great. But do you know that? Do you know that God is for you? It's only as you know that God is for you can you truly realise that whoever is against you, they cannot win, they cannot prevail. David knows that. How does he know it? How can we know it? The only way he knows it and the way we can know it is through prayer. It's prayer that makes David stand. It's prayer that he has, by prayer that he has proved the armour that he will use before Goliath. It's the power of the Lord and his trust in him. Prayer has prepared him for battle. Prayer has settled his heart on the Lord and he knows the one who is for him. He knows the Lord is on his side. And so in verse 18 of Ephesians, literally it starts through all prayer. Through all prayer. Put on. Put on the armour of God. Put it on through prayer. Put on that armour through prayer and then you and it will be effective. You will be an effective soldier for Christ. Prayer makes the Christian a fearless soldier. Put on the gospel armour. Each piece put on with prayer. We sing it in a hymn, we'll sing it at the end. Put on the gospel armour. Each piece put on with prayer. That's how we do it. It's through prayer. It's through prayer and our understanding of what that gospel armour stands for, what it symbolises. It's all in Christ. Prayer puts life into the armour. It works on the heart of the Christian to convince them of the power, the power of God to deliver. Prayer makes the Christian a fearless soldier. And in verse 18 of Ephesians, it's all kinds of prayer. Through all prayer, this is the literal again, through all prayer and petition. Prayer shapes the Christian. Prayer stops the Christian from becoming dry, dead, with, I'll say, just the doctrine, though the teaching is vital and important. But it stops the Christian from being a dry and dull Christian. It brings life to the teaching of the word. It brings life to the heart. And it brings life in terms of holiness. It takes the Christian from knowing about God. Do you know about God? If you have the Bible, if you read it, then you can know about God. But there are many people who know certain things about God. We've spoken about churches that might think they're perfect in doctrine. We can know about God, but not actually know Him. It takes us from knowing about Him to knowing Him ourselves more and more and more. Jesus said, He said, This is eternal life. That they may know, he's praying to his father and he says, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. 
We often talk, people talk about going to heaven. I'm a Christian. I'm going to heaven. Is that the greatest thing about being a Christian? That when you die you'll go to heaven? Is that what being a Christian is? That you're saved from your sins? No, it's not. Being a Christian is this. This is eternal life. To know God, the Father, and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. That is a Christian. One who knows God the Father and Jesus Christ. Not just knows about him, but knows him intimately. Knows him himself, herself, personally. Let me ask you, are you familiar with Almighty God? Are you familiar with Jesus? In other words, do you know something about him? Do you know that Jesus came to die on the cross for sinners? You may say, ah, yes, I know that. Ah, But do you know... Do you know whether or not he's died for you? Do you know him, Jesus, as your Lord and Saviour? Do you know God the Father? Do you have that personal relationship with him? Are you born again? These are vital questions. Because before we can come to talk about prayer, we have to deal with that. A person must be saved before they can pray to God. And to be saved, we must trust in the one whom he has sent, Jesus Christ, who lived that perfect life. I've never lived a perfect life. Anyone who's near me knows that I'm not perfect now. I'm far from it. We're all sinners, every one of us. And one day we we sang it, didn't we? Come to judgment, come to judgment. What a call that will be. We may sing it with gusto now, but if that day of judgment comes to us and we're without Christ those words will come back to haunt us and though we would resist, though we would hide though we would run the other way those words come to judgement they will have a draw and a pull about them that will be irresistible, we won't be able to stop we won't be able to run but if we come to Christ now if we know the Lord Jesus Christ now as our Lord and our Saviour then we can know what it is Begin to know what it is to have eternal life. This is eternal life. That they may know you, God the Father, and me, Jesus Christ the Son, the one whom you have sent. Do you know Jesus? Have you repented of your sin? Are you trusting in him? Do you see that his death on the cross was the atoning sacrifice? Puts everything right, takes away all your sin. Takes away the sin of everyone who never believed in him. That's the gospel message. Now that saved saint, a person who was a sinner is now saved. They're a saint. But what is their prayer life like? What is your prayer life like? You see, I would suggest that one major reason why Christians become worldly, why Christians become joyless, maybe even a bore to be around, is because they're prayerless. Prayerless. So you can be saved. But you're prayerless. Prayerless. The thriving Christian is a praying one. Through all prayer and petition, Paul says in Ephesians. Through all prayer and petition. Petition requests. Through all prayer and petition. In other words, Paul is saying... There are different kinds of prayer. Different ways to pray. And what I'm saying to you, he says, is you've got this armour. In order to be effective as a soldier for Christ, you need all prayer. You put it on through all prayer and petition. All prayer and requests. Different forms of prayer. So there's a person, and I pray every morning. Full stop. That's me. I've had my prayer now, and don't trouble me now until tomorrow morning. That's me and God, we've done our business. But you look at Christ, and Christ was a man of prayer. Spent whole nights in prayer. He was in continual communion with his Father. If you're in love with someone, if you're in love with someone, you want to be with them, don't you? You want to commune with them, you want to talk to them. You want to share your life with them. If you're a true saint, 
then you are born again. A saint is someone who is a sinner, but their sin has been wiped away. And they are now a saint through Christ Jesus. And they are in a relationship with him. And it's a relationship of love because that new life in you, it is that you cannot help but love him. And that's reflected in a life of prayer. So if you say that you love him, do you pray? Do you pray? Prayer, you see, is the way that we get to be with the Lord. It's the way that we get to know him more. It's not just about reading his word. It's about prayerfully reading his word. It's about praying over his word. It's about communing with him. So we're to, through all prayer and petition, in other words, we're to pray in private. We're to pray publicly. We're to pray in that uh, secret place. Some of us the other day, I think it was at our prayer meeting, we were looking at Jesus when he says, uh, just before uh, teaching them what we call the Lord's Prayer, he said, go into your room, your inner room. And again, looking at the Greek, not that I can read Greek, but it's wise to look at these things, what it meant in the original, looking at the Greek and it was this. Go into your closet or your secret chamber. In other words, Jesus is saying, you want to know how to pray. The way to pray is Get on your own. Go to a place where you can meet your maker. Just you and him. And then you talk to him. This is what you say as he goes on in his prayer. We're to pray in private. But we're not just to go and shut the door, as it were, and be on our own. We're also to pray in public. The Bible has many wonderful examples of great public prayer. Prayer meetings. We're to go into the country and pray alone in the country on our own, perhaps. We're to pray late at night. Jesus did. He prayed through the night. We're to pray before anyone rises. We've woken up early that morning. Let's go and pray. We're to pray on our knees. We're to pray sitting. We're to pray standing. We're to pray walking. There's no set requirement over these things. We're to pray with sighs, with groans, with intelligent words. With our lips, silently from our hearts. We're to pray with adoration. We pray with words of worship and praise and thanksgiving. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything with prayer and petition and with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And as you do so, what does Paul say? He says that the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So let me ask you again, Christian, if you're a Christian here this morning, what place does prayer have in your life? What place does it have? Can I suggest that it, it should have the foremost place? Can I ask, does it have the foremost place? Does it have the foremost place in your life? Would you, if you had to stand up and, um, and speak, would you say, actually, prayer, well, I understand it's important, but my own prayer life, I have to say, it's not good. Does that trouble you? Does that trouble you? If your prayer life is not good, I hope it does. Because it should do. What's the cure? What's the cure? The cure is that you tell the Lord about your condition. The cure is that you tell the Lord how unhappy you are. That your prayer life is so dry and cold. That's the cure. The cure is that you ask him again and again, Lord, help me. The disciples, they said, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. Lord, teach me how to pray. Lord, it's not so much that I want eloquent words and so on. It's not for, Lord, I want to commune with you. I want to meet with you. I want to have intimate times with you. Teach me, Lord. Come to me. Help me, Lord. I'm desperate. And set aside, I would suggest, Set aside a special time for prayer. Surely, in the course of a seven day week, we can find a couple of hours or more to set aside time for the Lord. A special time, beyond what we would normally do, to really seek Him. You see, if you turn to Mark, and I'm drawing to a close now, but if you turn to Mark chapter 9,
What do you find? You find in Mark chapter 9, and you come to verse 80, uh, 28. Well, 88 doesn't go that far. Verse 28. There's a man who has a son, and the boy is demon possessed, and Jesus casts out the demon. None of the disciples could do this. Though they had power given to them over demons, none of them could do this. Then in verse 28, Jesus, he goes indoors, his disciples, they ask him privately, why couldn't we do it? Why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can only come out by prayer. My Bible has a note, prayer and fasting. I would put the two together because I think they're important. I think prayer and fasting go together. This kind can only come out by prayer and by fasting. Now if we turn to our day, the cure, the cure for the lack of prayer is prayer. The cure for the lack of prayer in my own life is prayer and fasting. It is what I've just said, it is taking time out to be with the Lord. And just throwing yourself before him. That's the cure. The cure for a lack of prayer life is prayer. It's prayer. But I'm not talking about going through the motions. I'm talking about getting alone with the Lord. That's where the fasting comes in. Because it gives you that focus. Rumbling of the tongue. Why is my stomach rumbling? Because I want food. Why do I want food? Why am I not eating food? Because this is an important thing. I must seek the Lord. For all I'm worth. I must come to him. I need to restore my prayer life. Then add to that. Add to that the days that we live in. You see we've got to the point. In our day. Today. Where all we do as churches. All we do is pretty useless really. What churches are doing. It's very much like when you look at churches in this land today. It's very much like when the apostles. They'd gone into the temple grounds and they were arrested and there they were before the Sanhedrin and they were being told off and so on. And Gamaliel speaks up on their behalf and he says, leave these men alone. If, and he gives examples of this, if what they're doing is their own idea, it will come to nothing. And he gives examples of two people who led rebellions and it came to nothing because it was their own idea. But if it's from God, you cannot stop it. Let me put to you, let me suggest to you that the reason the church is so weak today and so many of the plans of churches in our land come to nothing is because it's not of God. It's of us. And it's come to us through our own imagination. We're trying to do things ourselves. Whereas what is needed at a day like this, this kind only come out by prayer and fasting. We're in a day, this day can only be conquered by prayer and fasting. That's a fact. It's a fact. I gave it the title, didn't I? Prayer makes the Christian a fearless soldier. And that's a nice title, isn't it? One of those punchy titles. A fearless soldier. It means nothing, doesn't it, really? It's a, it's a buzzy thing. Next week we'll have another title and so on. You, know, you see titles for sermons and they're, they're catchy and, and, and it's just to get the, the preacher through it perhaps. Something people might like. Prayer makes the Christian a fearless soldier. Really? Does it? It's a nice word, isn't it? It's a nice sentence. But you see, it does. It does. I'm not just trying to say that because, hey, that fits and that would be good and I can go home and have my tea in a minute. It does. I'm not fearless. I've got problems with my prayer life. But I suggest you've got problems with your prayer life as well. But I also tell you that prayer, fact, makes the Christian a fearless soldier. Because through prayer, we begin to know, deep within, something of how great God is. And the world that once seemed so great, diminishes. And that enemy, that Goliath, that devil, that seems so powerful, suddenly has wings like a butterfly. That if you 
got hold of. Prayer makes the Christian a fearless soldier. Gideon. Gideon. Here's the real answer. Gideon wasn't a coward. Gideon wasn't a a wretched sinner and should be cast off the face of the earth for putting God to the test. What Gideon did was that, well, what happened was that God came to Gideon in an extraordinary way, an extraordinary encounter with the angel of the Lord. That doesn't normally happen. Gideon had never known anything like that before. But what he does next, what Gideon does, is what you and I do, and are to do, in the more normal situations. We have a sense that God is calling us to something. We don't just say, hey, great, God is calling me to be a missionary in somewhere where I'm likely to lose my life. I'm off, when's the next plane? We would painstakingly and prayerfully consider this. And through prayer, God would strengthen us. God would embolden us. God would convince us of these things so that when we go, we go knowing. knowing. Who is it There was a, a Christian who said... Or was put to him that, how can you go to this place where there's great danger? Don't you fear? Don't you fear death? And he said, we died before we came here. In other words, they let the whole world go. And God was central to their hearts and lives. How? Through prayer. God was, Gideon was doing what we would normally do. Yes, he has a dialogue with the Lord. The angel of the Lord is present there before him and there's this dialogue. But that's prayer. In the normal circumstances, we don't see the angel of the Lord, but we pray. And what Gideon was doing through his prayer was strengthening himself. And that's what we do. That's what we're called to do. To strengthen ourselves. Proving the armour. Strengthening our faith. You see, like Israel, we have fled the battlefield. Prayer is the battlefield. And we fled it. We fled the battlefield. Not till we recover. Not till we recover that ground. The ground of prayer. Not till we do that. Will there be any Christians who are fearless soldiers. Who are bold for Christ. And then. Then the world will sit up. What it David say he said today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel the whole world will know because David has proved his armour through prayer he knows his God Christian you need to prove your armour through prayer then the world will sit up take notice until we do that we're in the pathway of defeat may we all take these things to heart Amen.